Tithes and offerings, lesson eight, giving in the epistles. So it is important to remember that the New Testament doctrine, that New Testament doctrine is established upon the Old Testament. So the New Testament directly quotes the Old Testament 695 times and references it 4,105 times. I'm going to say that again because especially in today's society, there's a, well, we, just, we don't need to read the Old Testament. That's all law. No, it's not. You don't know the Word of God. There's only one full book and a few others, parts of others, that have to do with the law. The rest of it's history, poetry, other things of that nature, but it all establishes doctrine for the New Testament. So the New Testament, let me give you an example, just because I want to break this down a little bit, because I know I say that quite a bit, but what would we be today as a society if we didn't understand or didn't have the Constitution of the United States? What would we be? How would we know what this country was founded on? We wouldn't. We wouldn't know anything. We'd be bigger ignoramuses as a country than what we already are. I love my country. I serve my country. I'm still proud to be an American, but in many regards, we've slacked off and we've become retarded on many levels. So, but everybody keeps it. The Supreme Court, what they're, part of what their job is, and I'm not trying to be political this morning, is to say this is constitutional or this is not constitutional. Well, what do they do? They go back to an original document that this nation was founded on. So that is the same idiocracy. If you say, we don't need the Constitution anymore, we don't need that, that's the same idiocracy, the same spirit that says, we don't need the Old Testament anymore. Because you're throwing away your foundation of what everything in the New Testament is all based on. The New Testament builds upon what the Old Testament says. It doesn't negate it, it doesn't push it away, it builds upon it. That's the, the Old Testament is the foundation and the New Testament is like setting up the rest of the house. <laughs> and then you have the book of Revelation. It's just like the roof upon their everything. It just keeps everything and says, all right, get ready for everything else that's coming. The shelter is going to be God, so put this roof on to be ready. Anyway, the New Testament directly quotes the Old Testament 695 times and references it 4,105 times. We should expect the New Testament to reiterate the Old Testament's established given, giving doctrines. So remember, the primary use of the Old Testament tithe and offering was to support the Levites and establish God's covenant. So New Testament giving supports the gospel worker. Romans 16, 1 and 2 says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Sincrea, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you. For she herself has also been a help of many and of myself as well. So Phoebe was a deaconess of the Sincrean church. She delivered the Roman epistle to the church at Rome. So Paul commanded the Roman church to care for her in whatever way she required. This is offerings. This is giving unto this minister of the gospel. So I don't believe in female preachers. Well, you're an ignoramus. You don't know the word of God because she's a deaconess. She's carrying the word of God. She may not stand and read it. She may not be the one that wrote it, but she's carrying the word of God. And last time I checked, the Great Commission doesn't say, well, all you men go and do this and do that. That's not what it says. It says, go ye. All you that believe, go ye. Amen. So that means we're all supposed to be evangelists. We're all supposed to carry the light of God on the inside of us and be ministers of the word. But see, Paul here says he commanded. He didn't suggest. He didn't say, well, if you feel like it, but if you agree with her doctrine, if you really like her and you think she's attractive or you think that she's worthy of it. No, no, no. He commands. Paul commanded the Roman church to care for her in whatever way she required. Because one, he knows this lady's not going, not going to ask for anything that's out of the will of God. She's not, she's not going to ask for a boy toy. She's not going to ask for a Mercedes. I know they don't have cars in that time, but whatever fancy chariot and horse they had at that time. She's not going to ask for other things that's going to be lavish and spoil her. She's going to ask for the things of God. Because she's probably not going to ask unless she really needs it. <laughs> Amen. This also goes to show when you know when you have people have guest ministers in, it shows you who's of God and who's not. Because the ones that are of God, not that they have to be so humble and just bend over backwards, but they'll only ask for the things that they really need. 
well, you know, I, I would like this. Or, you know, if you just, you know, give me some water, if you just give me a little bit of food while I'm here, that's all I really care for, just that long as I can eat. Or then you got other ones that, I want only green M&M's, only this, only that. The, rooms, the, the, room in, the room that I stay in has to be 71 degrees. No warmer, no cooler. It had to be this kind of car to come pick me up. It's got to be this kind of, you got to give me this amount of money before I come. <laughs> this, this says, that, that shows you that they're out of the will of God. That shows you that they're divas. And those people, mm, you got to be careful that you don't give money to them or feed that kind of appetite. But we honor those who are actual gospel workers. Not just somebody who appears to be. Your actual gospel workers. So she had earned this honor as a gospel minister. Notice she earned it. Because she was a worker of the gospel. Paul constantly taught the Mosaic Law's principle of giving to support the gospel worker. 1 Corinthians 9, 6-14 says, Or do only Barnabas and I have the right or the authority to refrain from working? Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? I am not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does not the law also say these things? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake it is written. I love how Paul writes this. I love how Paul writes a lot of his stuff. He asks, sometimes he'll ask a question, and then he'll give you the answer just to make sure that you're not you know, take, perverting what he's trying to say or misunderstanding what he's trying to say. He says, let me ask you a question. Well, I, God knows his people, so that I know the Holy Spirit's inspiring me to maybe clarify a little bit or to make sure they know the right answer. I feel like that sometimes as a pastor. Sometimes I'll ask a question or, or say something. And I'm like, mm, I can judge by the Spirit. Right, you need to clarify that, okay? Yes, sir, we will do. Because people will take that and they'll run with it. In that vague, maybe that little bit of vague area, they'll take it and run with it. And that is not of God. We take him at his word. We understand his word. And if we don't understand it, we study it. Just like the disciples. Jesus would give a parable. He would put it out to the multitude and his disciples. But the disciples are the only one that really come after him and said, What do you mean by this, Lord? What do you mean by this, Master? I want to study this. I want to make sure I'm understanding this right. That shows you have a heart after God. A multitude will hear and then run away and do their own thing, whatever they purpose in their heart. But a disciple really wants to understand the word of God, get honed in on, I want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. There's been a few times maybe, maybe my, my boss or Pastor Chris or you know, things of that nature, or somebody that I, that I endear as a supervisor or somebody over me spiritually or naturally, that they give me a, a directive of something to do, and I'll say, okay, I I think this is what they mean, but let me make sure that I understand before I proceed. And I would rather over-communicate than to under-communicate, but butcher anything that, I'm, that I was asked to do, and then have not only myself have to clean it up, but them have to clean it up or get on to me because I didn't ask. You know, why, if you didn't understand it, why didn't you ask? Yes, sir. Why not ask beforehand? So I want to make sure I'm on the right page. Amen. <laughs> Coming back to this, yes, for our sake it is written because the plowman ought to plow in hope and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do we not do we not more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. So you... So you not do you not know, excuse me, that those who perform sacred services eat the, the food of the temple and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? So also the Lord directed or ordained those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. This passage establishes Old Testament, multiple Old Testament doctrines concerning the purpose and usage of tithes and offerings. This passage contains the following points. 
Number one, ministers have an authority. They have a right to refrain from secular employment in order to preach. This mirrors the Levites' lack of land inheritance and dependence on the tithe. So ministers have the right, the biblical authority. <laughs> you know, that's like some people say, you know, oh, that preacher ought to work. If I have to work, you got to work too. Well, there's plenty of Bible that says that he's actually supposed to be focused on the things of God. That's the whole reason that deacons were established in the book of Acts was so that the men of God could focus on the word of God and that the deacons were established in the leadership role to help take care of the people. So that way the people weren't being neglected and the word wasn't being neglected. But it also gave the deacons an opportunity to, to qualify, to step up to that next tier of leadership to receive that, not only the responsibility, but to receive that honor as being under those men of God to be, be part or caretakers of the, of the people of God. So the next one is soldiers, or we say employees, don't finance their own work. Soldiers, employees don't finance their own work. I'm surprised that, you know, being in my secular job that I do have, when we hire somebody, I say, well, you get mileage reimbursement. They're like, what? I get mileage reimbursement? I'm thinking, what kind of company did you come from? That you were required to travel and nobody cared about your traveling. That it was for the job that you had to go to different sites or different things. That's supposed to be part of the federal regulation is you get mileage reimbursement because you're using your personal vehicle to do work. But when you say that, people are like, really? Like they're just, they're so surprised. And they're like, oh man, I appreciate that. Because soldiers, or we would say employees, the verse says soldiers, but employees don't finance their own work. They're supposed to be compensated because they're working for the company. Soldiers are compensated for their work for the government. <laughs> that may not be the best compensation, but it is compensation. There are a lot of that. Being, being a veteran, I understand that we were, we were well taken care of in many regards. So part of that is a joke. It, it isn't best paid, but you do get a lot of things that you're well taken care of. But they don't finance their own work, and that's important. Vine dressers or owners eat from their own labor. They eat of their own labor. Shepherds, often slaves, drink milk of their own labor. The law forbids the muzzling of laboring oxen, preventing the hardworking beast from eating as he labored from cruel, unreasonable, and selfish, and is selfish. Plus, you had to replace that oxen quite often. Hmm. This, this will, this brings to mind the 90, the 90 and 10 rule. 90% of the work is done by 10% of the people. When actually it should be 100% of the work should be done by 100% of the people. Everybody should have their fair share in it. Amen. And I'm, I'm proud of our helps rate. We have a very high helps rate. But for this, many churches, they'll see, over, uh, they'll see turnover, lots and lots and lots, because they, the, there's only a few people that are willing to help and be a blessing to the kingdom and actually fulfill the word of God and the ministry of helps. And so they get burned out because nobody else is willing to help or nobody else will help. And so you burn those people out. Now you've got to find new oxen to help, take care of the, to help take care of the fields and help take care of the things that need to be taken care of. But see, the law, it says the law forbids the muzzling of laboring oxen. So preventing the hardworking beast from eating as he labored was cruel, unreasonable, and selfish. Plus, you had to replace that oxen quite often because you're going to kill that thing. You don't, let, you don't let that oxen eat, you're going to kill that thing. That's why we have a rotation of things that we do so that way people don't miss service. And for the services that are missed, we make available, whether podcast or whether YouTube or whatever, whatever media outlet you'd like to get on, you can go back and stream and, and see or hear whatever service you did miss. But we try to make that rotation possible where everybody can be, at least in the house of God, be in the service, not just working all the time. Amen. Spiritual things are worth more than natural wealth. Spiritual things are worth more than natural wealth. This is something that Many people in the world, but I would also dare say our region needs to understand, spiritual things are worth more. 
Because many people will chase after money, they'll chase after a job, they'll chase after many other things. Well, I'll find a church when I get there, or I'll find this when I get there. I'll do this whatever, wherever my job takes me, I'll find where I need to be. No, no, no. Spiritual things are worth more than natural wealth. I would rather be where God has called me to be and let him supply my need and him take care of me and lead me to the job that I need to be at rather than following money and then finding a half pagan church that suits my needs because I'm not really following God anyway. I'm following a job. I'm following money. Amen. I've been there. Not following it, not seeking a church after following money. I've been in a situation a couple of different times where we said, Miss Tiffany and I were like, well, we're going to church there. God will supply the need. God will provide the jobs. And God did every time. Amen, because he's faithful to his word. The Levites lived by the altar they served. They lived by the altar they served. It is ordained by God that ministers live by the gospel tithes and offerings. It is ordained by God that ministers live by the gospel tithes and offerings. There is a grace to give. The New Testament reveals there is a supernatural grace to give financially. 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5, 7 and 12 says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian church, churches. Excuse me. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in, gener- in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded for us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then, by the will of God, also to us. But since you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and complete uh, earnestness, and in, the, and in the love we have kindled for you in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. So this passage establishes the doctrine of a giving grace. So we can see multiple points here. We should have a reputation for generosity like the Macedonians. We should have a reputation for generosity. This also, this also should be indicated when we tip waiters and servers. Many people don't like to hear that, especially in this region. Well, I, don't, I gave them a dollar. I gave them two dollars. That's all they worth. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So, so you mean to tell me that somebody who waited on you hand to foot, because most people, when they go to a restaurant, they're not, even some of the nicest people, that are not the nicest when it comes to servers. Why? Because, well, they're serving me. They're here to do what I tell them to do. They're here to get me what I want because I'm the customer, so they're to, to be at my beck and call and to give me what I want. So if they serve you good, even if they serve you bad, what's, what's going to be your reputation after you leave? I, myself, I don't do it all the time, but I've seen a few articles or I don't know what you call it, online things, where it talks about the, you know, name, like, it would give a number of this many celebrities and whether they're good tippers or not. I click on that. I, I read that every once in a while. And here's why. Because what they portray on TV and who they are in real life may be two different things. And you'd be surprised. Some of the turds in the punch bowl that are big celebrities that make a killing off of portraying this wonderful, nice person, but they're a jerk in real life. Same goes with some Christians. They'll come to the house of God, put on this smiling face, just so friendly to everybody, but as soon as they think they have authority over somebody and go to a restaurant, they'll treat them like dirt. Where's my water? Where's my this? Where's my that? How dare you treat me like this? I ain't coming back here no more. I ain't leaving you a tip. You going to be a jerk? That's, that's a way to influence somebody to come to the house of God and be born again. I actually heard of a preacher in this region who got up and left for, because his it re, left a restaurant because his server had a nose ring. Because he said, that's, that's not of God. He quoted Leviticus, which we don't agree with. 
It is. It sh- it, usually when you see nose piercings and things of that nature, it either means they serve an idol or it's sexual trauma, things of that nature. That's too much to get into right now. So when you see that, that means there's usually a demon associated with it. Anyway, this person got offended, super religious, just because the server comes, they leave the whole establishment. Instead of being a light unto them, like I've seen my pastor and other true ministers of God that have a heart for people, instead of being religious with a religious broom stuck up the rear, where they actually honor God and say, hey, do you go to church anywhere? They start having a conversation with the person, inviting them to church. Then I've heard some people, wow, that's not for me. I don't really, I don't really, I don't really agree with that, or I'm this, or I'm that. And then other people will say, you know what? I, probably, I really should. You know, I used to go to church when I was younger, but I've gotten out and I've, I've backslid. And they begin to just confess things. And then, start, and then start talking about how they need to get back in church. But to see, if we're too religious and we're not good givers and we don't have kind of this attitude of, I'm going to be a light no matter where I go, then you be stingy and you, be, you, you hoard that. You hoard that kind of attitude. You hoard your money and not be a giver, not be generous in those things. What if Jesus was to say, you know what? These people, they've been out here for me, with me for days. We've got this fish and bread Let's just keep it for us, disciples, because they're not worthy of it. Even though that they've been here, they've listened to me, and they've done all this, they're not worthy of it. Let's just keep it for us. That, wouldn't, that would have made him the opposite of the Son of God. That would have made him more like Satan. So we should have a reputation of being generous. There are some people that they think, they think it's funny, they think it's cute, but they'll leave like this, what looks like a $100 folded, $100 bill folded on the table, and when you open it up, it's actually something inviting somebody to a church or how they need to be born again or whatever. Yeah, that's demonic. That is not of God. That's not being generous. So by what you think is cute and funny and inviting somebody to church, you're actually going to tick them off, and they'll probably be more bitter at church people. We should be generous. <laughs> you know, there's been times where Somebody may have not treated us the best when we were the customers and they were coming in to be our servers, but we still tipped them well because I thought, you know, at the end of the day, I want them to see the smile on our faces and how we treated them. Even though they treated us horribly, I want them to feel that, that heaping coals upon their head according to the word because when you give in to that flesh, that just as they're giving into the flesh, all you're going to do is show you're no different than they are. But when you can have the love and the peace of God within you and still be generous and still show the love of God, the, the peace of God, the smiling, and letting it come through your presence, that's going to either, it's either going to heap coals upon their head to make them, man, I couldn't make them, man, man, I couldn't get them on my level, or it's going to convict them. They say, man, I shouldn't have treated them like that. Maybe I should, maybe I should find a church or maybe I should whatever. It may convict them. But we're to have a reputation of being generous. This grace is not dependent on natural conditions. This grace is not conditioned on natural conditions. But it says this grace provides for supernatural giving beyond what is possible. Amen. Giving is a privilege that aids God's people. Giving requires that you first be given to the Lord, then your spiritual leadership. Therefore, non-givers are probably not submitted to God or their leadership. This is where we get the idea that why I look at tithing graphs. Not how much everybody gives. I don't see dollar amounts. Don't care about dollar amounts. But when I can see somebody's honoring God and giving their tithes and giving offerings and things, and I can see that, at least it should be going up because you see the promotion increase in favor of God. But even if it's you know, kind of up and kind of maintaining that same area that shows they're being faithful, they're being steady. But when all of a sudden you start seeing that thing come down, that means, one, they're not submitting to God, and two, they're not submitting to their spiritual leadership. Let's read it again. Giving requires that you first be given to the Lord. First. Even bringing back this verse, because I know our region, I know that what they'll say. Verse 5, if you look back in the paragraph above with the verses... And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord. 
and then by the will of God also to us. So Paul says, they're obeying God, and then they turn around and obeyed us and blessed us and helped us. They obeyed by giving and obeying God. That's how they obeyed Paul. But it says, non-givers are probably not submitted to God or their leadership. They lack the vision of the local house. They lack the vision of the local house. So one way you can tell if somebody, I can as a pastor, I can see, all right, I can look at that chart and see, are they given? Now, yes, if there is a dip, I can say, all right, because I'm their pastor, they've come to me and said, hey, I had to take a pay cut or, hey, I, you know, I got laid off of my job or, hey, whatever the case may be. There you can say, okay, I need to help pray for them financially. But if you see that steady over time going down, that probably means they're pulling back from their heart. They're pulling back from where they said they were called to be. But it says they lack the vision of the local house. So that's one way you can see. But also another way I can see is the pastor who hasn't caught our vision. Who hasn't caught our vision for this local house of God? Oh, pastor, I'm called to be there. I'm called to be with you. I'm called to be at Abundant Grace Church. Well, why haven't you caught our vision? Because your mouth will say one thing, but your life will say another. Because that's no different than the children of Israel. With their mouth, they honored God, but their heart was far from him. So obviously they didn't catch his vision and run with the vision he gave them. They were running with their own vision. We are all commanded to excel in the giving grace. Our willingness makes, us, makes our offering acceptable to God, not the amount. I want to read that again. For many people, well, that preacher, he's just watching how, I, how much everybody gives. No, 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 don't care. I just want you to obey God. Because if you don't obey God, all that stuff's going to dry up in your life anyway. I just want to say, all right, they're obeying God. Praise God. <laughs> I'm reminded that Dr. Barclay and Pastor Chris, I've heard them both say it multiple times. There's always a Judas in training. That's sad, but it's very true. There's always a Judas in training. Because you never know when that Judas is going to rise up and do what he feels like he must do to betray everybody around him. Because not only did Judas betray Jesus, which is the most evident, he also betrayed his other disciples. Anyway, our willingness makes, us, makes our offering acceptable to God, not the amount. It's all about the heart. Our giving should provoke others to generosity. You know how the, for a while it was very popular, like when somebody would go to, I don't know, to a drive through restaurant or whatever the case may be, drive through something, and somebody would say they would pay for theirs, and then they would say, I'm going to pay for the one behind me. And then so that one, when they pulled up, they pulled up and said, oh, it was paid for by the person in front of you. Well, that's so awesome. You know what? I'm going to pay for the person behind me. And they would keep that going for a while. Now, yes, we understand that not everybody can afford to do that, especially if, you know, the person in, in the line about to pay, they realize that they're, they're a single person, and all of a sudden the family behind them has got like 20 people in a van. They may not be able to afford that much. But the heart of it, of that generous heart, it should provoke others to give. Man, they've done that for me. That is so awesome. That is, that is such a blessing. And then you pay it forward. You feel, like, you feel that generosity like, man, I, I want to give. I want to give. I, don't, I, I want to provoke to good works. I want to be a blessing to somebody. That should be our testimony as Christians. Not only to give to the house of God, but to have that generosity, that grace gift upon our lives to give to others. So our giving should, should provoke others to generosity. We should aim to set an example with our lifestyle of giving. So 2 Corinthians 9, 2 says, For I know your eagerness to help by giving, and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year you and Achaia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. Praise God. <laughs> you know, Having actions that follow God should be contagious. It should be our enthusiasm for obeying God and serving God. Should, it should be not only evident in our lives, but it should provoke others to want to do the same thing. That's how you can tell when somebody's religious. Oh, well, they're doing that over there? Well, I don't want no part of that. 
I don't want no part of that. That's not the way we do it. I, I, that wouldn't, that wouldn't, in my, in my heart, I'll start preaching another message. <laughs> It says, we should have an eager heart to give towards the gospel. Generosity is a braggable offense. It is praiseworthy to be generous. It's praiseworthy to be generous. It's worthy of praise. You know what's not praiseworthy? Being stingy. That makes everybody, it irritates everybody. <laughs> hmm. Some, some churches are so stingy, they won't even share the gospel. The gospel is given unto them freely. The Bible says you freely, freely receive, freely give. So if you receive of the love of God, you know the salvation. Or maybe you didn't really receive it. Maybe you just put on the facade of being born again, of having salvation. But So you don't really know what it's about, so you just put on the religious facade. And then you don't want to give it away because you don't know what you're trying to sell. Anyway, our giving should be enthusiastic, which means strong excitement of feeling. Our giving should be enthusiastic. Inspiring zeal is also another definition for enthusiastic. At Christmas time, my family knows I either have to forget about the gift or I got to buy it last minute. See, I already got an agreement. Why? Because... It's hard for me to hold on to that gift because I get so excited to give it to whoever it is, whether it be one of the boys or Miss Tiffany. It's hard for me to hold on to that. So, it's, so I'm like, oh, it's the 15th of December. I already got you a Christmas present. You want to open it right now? We've still got 10 days to Christmas. You want to open it? Might as well. Might as well go ahead. And then what do I do? If I can talk them into receiving it, I'll give it to them. Then I'll go buy something else. Because now I feel like, man, they got to have something on Christmas. So I have to either try to forget about the gift or I try to wait till the last minute to figure out what I need to do. So that way it is closer to Christmas to give. But there's an enthusiasm because I enjoy that. I don't, I don't enjoy spending money. And that's not it. I enjoy seeing the, seeing the look on their faces when they say, oh, man, this is so awesome. Thank you. I enjoy the the. the the excitement that they have to open a present, to the excitement they have to see you know, them open whatever it is that I got them. I'm excited for it. That's the way we should be for the house of God. But many people, they take the enthusiasm out of it because they're too religious. Oh, I've got to give in this offering. Oh, i got to give to this. Oh, i got to give to that. <laughs> Where's your enthusiasm? Oh, that's right. You left it at the house because after the football game's over, you don't have any enthusiasm. After, you know, you get it back when you get home and you turn on the TV to watch your football game on Sunday, but then you'll lose it as soon as the game's over and go back to the house of God. <laughs> Our enthusiasm will, will stir others to action, or it should. Our enthusiasm should stir others to action. Reaping like we've sown. So 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, 10, 11, and 13 says, Remember this. Whosoever, whoever, sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generous, generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Notice, all of these alls and bless you's. <laughs> Not because you sneezed. These bless you's because you're obedient. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and everyone else. So giving is called sowing. We reap what we sow. We control our harvest. It's another way to think about it. Generous sowing produces a generous harvest. God wants us to decide in our hearts what to give. That way we can be cheerful about the gift. 
I've been in situations where somebody give up or get up and say, well, we're going to take up an offering for so-and-so, and I'm giving $1,000 right now. Who else will give? And they'll start trying to you know, poll the audience and trying to get people to give and tell what they're going to give. That's not of God. You should purpose in your heart what you're going to give and say, Father, I'm, I, you know my budget. You know where I'm at financially, but I purpose in my heart to give this. If God is the one that says, I want you to stretch a little bit and give this, by all means, obey God. But if it's somebody else <laughs> that's trying to pull you and pull more money out of the congregation, that's not of God. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and I like what Pastor Chris says. Sometimes in those situations, you just withhold your offering. Pray about it. And if you feel like you need to give it to that person at ministry later, go back and do it then. But don't feel compelled and don't, be, don't have your arm twisted to give just because somebody's running their mouth and pulling on emotions. Amen. So don't let anyone compel you to give. This will produce a reluctance to do so. God's will for us is to abound. This passage contains the following powerful terms in relation to our giving. Reap generously. Bless you abundantly. All that you need, you will abound, increase, enlarge, enrich, generous, and generosity. Giving is an act of obedience that demonstrates and confirms our confession of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Giving is an act of obedience. And it demonstrates. It's the demonstration of our faith. The demonstration of our confession. It confirms our confession of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stinginess produces an inferior church. Hmm. That explains a lot. A stingy church will be an inferior, will be inferior to generous churches. 2 Corinthians 12.13 for what is it wherein ye were inferior or lesser to other churches, except it be that my, I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong or unrighteousness. Due to internal complaining, external slander, inherent stinginess, and challenges to Paul's apostleship, 1 Corinthians 9, 1 through 3, Paul chose to forego receiving offerings from the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 9, 12. So due to internal complaining, external slander, inherent stinginess, and challenges to Paul's apostleship, that shows that, one, they weren't submitted to God, but they also weren't submitted to their spiritual leader. Because when you're complaining internally, and then you externally slander, that shows that you're not in line with God. You're not in tune with God, because both of those are against the Word of God. When you have internal complaining, because the word says don't grumble or murmur. That's internal complaining. That's what that is. If you have a complaint, take it to God. Don't keep it internal. Talk to Him about it. Because usually if you talk to Him about it, you'll find that we're the ones that are in the wrong. God says, well, have you looked at it this way? Uh, no, sir. I can see your point. <laughs> external slander. That's never of God. External slander. We can judge fruit, but there's no external. We shouldn't slander. Inherent stinginess shows you don't have a heart to give and challenges the Paul's apostleship. Well, that shows that you're not in line with God because if the apostle Paul has written two-thirds of the New Testament, and you're challenging who he is in God, and that he, if he's ordained of God, then you might want to check yourself. But it says, Paul recognized that asking the Corinthians to support him financially had the potential to hurt the short-term preaching of the gospel, so he withheld his right. However, in doing so, he inadvertently caused the Corinthian church to become an inferior church. This was Paul's doing. His decision had harmed the Corinthian believers. This was an unrighteous act that he had to repent of. So giving and receiving. The epistles further reveal, aside to biblical giving that was perhaps not fully revealed in the Old Testament. The twofold nature of giving and receiving. Philippians 4, 14-17. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. So this passage is very telling. 
There is something to receive when giving. In Philippians 1.7, Paul calls the Philippians partakers or partners of and with his grace. When we give, we receive of the grace on the ministry we give to. Be careful who and what you give to. I'm going to say this again. When we give, we receive of the grace on the ministry we give to. Now, this is twofold. One, as, as written in this lesson, be careful who and what you give to, because if they're a perverted ministry, you're going to reap of that perver- perversion. But two, what if you give to a holy ordained ministry, then all of a sudden you dry that up just out of, because of your lack of walking with God or your lack of obedience. The graces that, of that ministry that you've been giving to and have been accounted to your life, once you quit giving that, and God, but God hasn't told you to stop giving, that means those graces and those giftings on your life will dry up. I've heard it many times, many times. I've heard different ministers, especially my pastor, say, I, I really don't want to set this person down, although I need to. Because I know that their life is already hanging on by a thread. If I set them down from this leadership role, the grace is on our ministry that's on their life. Everything may implode. And that was his hesitation. It wasn't so much that they deserve the right to still be in that leadership position. It was, I know as soon as I set them down, that grace that's on their life to help them because of the role that they fulfill is going to dry up. And the other graces in their life will dry up. That's also why it's another telltale sign. When you leave where you're called, things will dry up in your life and things will not go well for you. Because you're not partaking, you're not partaking in that grace that's upon that ministry that you were called to. Something to think about. But see, everybody just thinks, well, we'll just do what we want to. We'll just, we'll just you know, live our life the way we want to. There is so much word that people lack like to study that people don't understand, and then they wonder why all hell is breaking loose in their life because they've quit giving, because they've quit honoring God, because they've quit going where they're called to go. They've dried up so many things of God in their life. And then you're like, why is there so much demonic activity? Why is there so much things in my life that's not of God? Well, probably because you quit on God. So he quit protecting you because he has no right to your life now. Amen. Giving as a sweet aroma. Philippians 4.18 But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Ephroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. The picture painted by Paul here is one of Old Testament animal sacrifices being burned on the altar of God. Genesis 8.21 and Exodus 29.18 This confirms that the source of the sweet aroma God is looking for is not from the natural offering, neither the burnt sacrifice nor the cash gift, but from the heart behind the gift. If our hearts are right, our financial giving will produce the same smell as Noah's post-flood burnt offering. It's the heart. I've said it since day one since I've been pastor here. It's not about the amount. It's about your heart. So this is scripture backing up exactly what we've said for couple years now but this confirms going back to this lesson this confirms that the source of the sweet aroma god is looking for is not from the natural offering but neither the burnt offering nor the you know, the burnt sacrifice nor the cash gift but from the heart behind the gift so giving as the as the supply qualifier financially supporting the gospel qualifies you to receive your supply from god philippians 4:19 by my god but my God, excuse me, shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by, Jesus, by Christ Jesus. This often quoted verse follows after Paul brags on the Philippians' generosity. The promise of having one's needs supplied by God is contingent upon the believer first supplying God's needs. So we reap what we sow. So we can see that many people will take this verse out of context. God will supply my needs. God will supply my needs. But you don't look at the verse before it, which says, because you are a giver, God will be a giver. Because you're obeying God, God takes care of you. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but see, you don't hear that in modern churches, because that means there's something required on the listener's part. There's something required on the Christian's part. 
Amen. Giving as a demonstration of honor. The common theme over and over again in the epistles is that the church is to provide the natural needs of the gospel ministers. This is done through tithes and offerings. Timothy, the book of Timothy, we should say, reveals that supplying the preacher's needs is an act of honor. 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18 says, Let the elder that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. We can see, well, man, that sounds familiar. Yeah, because we read it in another verse earlier. <laughs> This passage quotes Deuteronomy 25.4, 1 Corinthians 9.9, also quoting Deuteronomy 25.4, and Jesus Christ in Luke 10.7. Man, that's a lot of scripture. Building upon this established doctrine, Paul adds that gospel ministers are to be are worthy of double honor. The first honor is respect for their office. Notice respect for their office. Not for who they are, not for their likes and dislikes, but for their office. The second is the financial gift for their support. All commentaries agree this honor is a reference to remuneration for services rendered. To review, we can clearly see the New Testament doctrine confirms and solidifies the Old Testament giving doctrines. We have observed the following. Giving in the New Testament is first and foremost to support the gospel minister. Like the Levites, the New Testament minister has the right to refrain from natural employment and be supported by the church. There is a supernatural grace to give, and this grace can be developed. Notice it can be developed. Why? That's not my grace, Pastor. Well, you can develop it because we're all called to give, myself included. God wants our giving to be willful willful and joyful. (laughs) Uh, Man, that'll preach to a lot of denominations. God wants our giving to be willful and joyful, not just financially, but even of the word. Our giving should be provocative, provoking others to do better. Giving allows God to bless us in a greater way. Stinginess produces an inferior Christianity and an inferior church. Giving qualifies us for God's abundant supply. Giving is a demonstration of honor. God is a giver and he wants us to be just like him. Amen.